All right. Greetings again, everybody. I'm Laura Frerix. I am the Executive Director of the University of Illinois Research Park and Enterprise Works Incubator. And we're happy to welcome you here today to one of our regular workshops with one of our entrepreneurs and residents. And he is our newest EIR. And we're going to be referring more clients for one-on-one -on -one assistance. But he's not new to us entirely. First of all, important to know that Mark is a University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign graduate. He is an expert in computer engineering and medical devices with experience at Baxter Global in Chicago area. And he has been working with new teams of entrepreneurs and other life sciences companies in his work with Biofia. Biofia is a consulting company that works with different life science entrepreneurs, healthcare organizations, and helping to advance their development. And so Mark comes to us both with that unique kind of background of both healthcare and computer programming that's driving the systems integration many of these new companies need. So he'll be talking more about his experience and what he's learned working with different venture teams along his pathway. We'll be putting in the chat a little bit more information. If you want one-on-one -on -one time with Mark, you can sign up for that as an entrepreneur in residence through the University of Illinois Research Park. So I think we're going to turn it back to you, Mark, with an introduction of yourself, and you'll take control of the slides. Thanks All for joining. Right. I will. Nothing I like more than having control. So, uh, <clears throat> and I will share my screen and put up my slides. And let's go into presentation mode. So um, everybody can see my slides, I hope? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So let me uh, let me get rid of this picture on the side. Okay. So first, uh, as you heard, uh, I am a graduate from the U of I. Um, I uh, have both a, I have a computer engineering degree. Probably the second class at U of I to have such a degree. When I started, it did not exist. Uh, when I started, I had to start in the electrical engineering department, uh, but then they created computer engineering when I was a sophomore. So <clears throat> that worked out nicely. Uh, I also played on the tennis team uh, when I was there. I was a walk-on, so I was more of an alternate than a regular, but uh, I did spend a lot of time playing tennis uh, down, down in Champaign. Also, one thing that's interesting, to, I think has been very beneficial for me personally is once I graduated and started working, I also started going to night school uh, to get my uh, master's in business administration. And so I was working full time and going to school uh, at nights. Uh, I have now spent roughly 40 years doing research and development on a variety of medical products. These products go, uh, in some cases, go into hospitals, some cases go into doctor's offices, and in other cases, patients actually use the products at home, and it's for a global market. <clears throat> so the products have uh, been uh, all over the world over the last uh, several years. What I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to talk about a little bit about some of the internal and some of the external venture teams. And then I want to get into some more details. But I think it's important to have a little bit of understanding of some of the products uh, that I've worked on. And so the first internal venture team uh, at Abbott Labs that I worked on was uh, one that Ed Moore, who's on the call with me, knows very well, because Ed, at a for a period of time, used to sit in the office right next to me as the R&D scientist when, uh, when I was an R&D um, uh, engineering manager. Uh, but the TDX actually was our second internal venture group within Abbott. Uh, the first one was actually a cancer test. Uh, and this was the second one, which was more of an instrument system. And so when you see something like an instrument, of course, one of the things you immediately come to mind is software and being a software engineer. Uh, my first job with this internal venture team was to develop a software team that could actually continue developing software for this product. During the five years that I was part of this team, um, we ended up uh, developing about 80 different types of diagnostic tests you could run on that instrument. Uh, which meant a lot over those uh, five years. Interesting thing about TDX was not that many years ago, uh, the 
COO of Abbott actually brought a bunch of us to his house for a 25 year reunion because the product was still on the market 25 years after we launched it in uh, 1981. So I think it's important to understand for many of you that medical products that really meet customers' needs will be around for a long time. Uh, the vision system right below it was the third internal venture team. Uh, that one we launched in 1985, but unlike TDX, which was for hospitals, the vision system was actually designed for doctor's offices. And uh, it wasn't that many years ago that uh, I got invited to a celebration where they had celebrated making or manufacturing the 100 millionth test for this particular instrument uh, for uh, vision. And uh, the third internal venture team, which was actually one that I personally led, which you can see there is no computer uh, involved in it, uh, was for uh, an emergency syringe product line. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, but just so you know that um, that's product line we launched back in about 1995. Uh, Abbott had spun off that group that was responsible for this product uh, in about 2003. A few years later, Pfizer bought that division from Abbott. Pfizer still manufactures this particular product you see called the Answer Syringe in the same manufacturing line uh, that my team installed back in uh, 1994 in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. Uh, and they still manufacture probably about 20 million products a year on that line. So. Uh, those are some internal venture teams, and we'll talk more about them, uh, and, and I get into some details about the really things that I, I learned during the time with those. Uh, if there's any questions, or I want to pause, because I know I talked about a few different products in case there's any questions. Laura, I don't know if that's a good idea to stop after each slide or not um, and ask for questions, but I thought maybe that would be appropriate. And Mark, we can monitor the chat. So we'll see if somebody's got a question. If you want to go ahead and put it sure. in the chat, we'll come back to Mark and let him know. And OK, thank we'll you. We'll interrupt you at that point, Mark, if that's yeah. all right. Please do. Please do. The other interesting thing about the answer syringe is, in this case, not only do we develop a technology, and I'll talk about it more in a minute, and a new product line for Abbott, but it's also a product line that Abbott and now Pfizer continues to out license to other pharma companies. And one of the original pharma companies uh, that we out licensed the technology to back in the uh, mid 1990s at that time was called Fujisawa. Today, Fujisawa doesn't exist, but the name Astellas is maybe a company that some of you may have heard of. It is based here um, uh, in the North, Northbrook, Illinois area and continues to contract with Pfizer to manufacture a product in the answer syringe product line. So uh, I think that's important to understand for some of you entrepreneurs that <clears throat> you may be developing a great technology or a great product for yourself, for your purposes, but you also may find that there's others that could benefit from the technology and the product you're developing and you should not um, shortchange yourself of a potential business opportunity to expand uh, the product that you might be developing today. And I wanted to bring that up when I talked about the answer syringe. Some of the external ventures, and I'm only going to talk about a, a couple of them, one of which was uh, called Optobionics. It does not exist uh, as a corporation uh, any longer. And what this company was working on was to allow people that were blind, and they would be blind from a couple of diseases. One is uh, retina pig pigmentosa and uh, ocular ARMD, um, age-related macular degeneration. And the idea and the technology here that uh, uh, a, a doctor and his brother, who was a, a, a really smart electrical engineer, a microcomputer expert, had developed was to implant inside the eye basically an integrated circuit it did not need any batteries. It did not need any external power. The power came from the light that was coming into the eye. Um, it was really, at the time, a very novel product. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, and we'll get to the story more later, where 
the entrepreneurs who started the company and the VCs that were backing it uh, were not seeing eye to eye any longer. And basically uh, the company went under when the money disappeared. Uh, so, uh, but we'll talk more about some of the learnings from that in a minute. The last one that I have to be a little careful about because it's not on the market yet. It is a COVID related diagnostic. And I do wanna talk about a few lessons learned uh, in the last six months that I've been involved uh, with this company that I think would be appropriate uh, for today's session. I will pause here before I get into some more of the uh, meat uh, in the meeting here. All right. And Go ahead, Laura. Well, I was just gonna say, Mark, I assume you'll tell us about some of the good, the bad of- the Absolutely, yep. Um, Need a little water, but okay. So let's talk about the TDX venture. Here was one of the things that uh, I wanted to bring up. When I joined the group, we were basically in uh, a room in the basement of one of the R&D buildings. And uh, to say in the basement, it really was the basement. Uh, and it was basically the uh, mechanical engineer who designed a lot of the TDX instrument you just saw. Uh, a packaging engineer, myself, uh, another software engineer that I uh, was on my team, and uh, basically a technician. Uh, and we basically had uh, our desks were separated by as about the distance of a chair you could pull back from your desk. There were no cubicles or things like that at the time. Um, and we were actually in the engineering lab. And we actually had one uh, uh, really nice technician who was able to build circuits build mechanical things, get parts machined, and make prototypes for us, uh, all sitting right together. I mean, when I say together, almost on top of each other. Also, in a little room right next to our lab was our venture manager, our marketing manager, a manufacturing manager, and my boss, who was at that time an engineering manager. Uh, the chemists that we worked with were in the same building, but they were on the second floor. So we were in the basement and they were up two floors, literally right above where we sat. Um, and what that allowed us to do was very quickly talk about issues, come to resolution, agree on a solution and move forward. And I know today in the COVID world that everyone is dealing with, uh, I don't want to say struggling with, but in some cases you might be struggling a little bit with, is, you know, we've learned, we've used a lot of technology to be as collaborative as possible, but having worked in these internal venture teams and external venture teams, when you could have people sitting right next to each other or on top of each other almost, versus what we have to do today, the a speed of decision-making the clarity of communication is just not the same. And, and, and some of you I'm sure can say, well, you know, I've used this tool and it works great. And, and I've come up with this technique for how to um, run uh, my meetings and, and have this, and, and we've all been dealing with it uh, clearly, but I can tell you having worked in both worlds now, and even because of the fact when you work on global products, oftentimes you have teammates who may be based outside the United States in time zones several hours away from you, uh, where you currently are. The face-to-face -face communication ability is just not the same. And I just wanna make that point that one COVID is over, whenever possible, I strongly encourage you to try and do co-location as much as possible. Um, I will even tell you a small story about uh, co-location, uh, even though it's not part of this venture team, it's part of another group when I was at Baxter, in which it was one of these situations where, you know, the, the, the uh, manufacturing engineers all sit in one corner of a building and these scientists sit in another corner and these doctors sit in another corner uh, and the marketing people sit over here and, and everyone sits in all these different corners of a building. <clears throat> And I went to uh, my boss who was uh, basically leading a new brand new business for Baxter and said, look, we need to try and get our team sitting together, not dispersed all over some huge commercial building uh, that Baxter owned. And because I could not convince my team to move to sit next to next to each other. I could not do it as the leader of a team. Um, 
And it actually took our divisional president to tell his staff that every member of his staff that's part of this team that Mark's leading, you will sit in this part of this building and you'll all sit together. Um, because even a president uh, of our division at the time recognized the importance of co-location. So I just wanted to share uh, that story. The other thing about internal venture teams, any, any venture team is not just quick decisions and agility, but how you can do experimenting with not asking for permission. And I wanted to tell this story because I, thought, I think it was, it, was, it was kind of fun is as a software leader, I was always concerned with bugs. I know today we don't call them bugs. For all you software uh, uh, geeks in, uh, on the call, you call them anomalies. But for us old software guys, we still call them bugs. And so I always worried about bugs getting into the marketplace and as a result, causing a recall. And I think it's really important that everybody on this call who's working on medical products have an appreciation that if something goes wrong after you launch your product and you have to do a recall, it is a very painful experience, both emotionally and financially. And so I was always panicked that I'm gonna have a bug come out of my team into the market. And so what I used to do was when we got close to releasing a software package, I would go to the bank, get a whole bunch of $5 and $10 bills, stick them in my pocket, and then challenge anyone on the team, including our venture manager, to try and find a bug. And if you did, I would just whip out some money out of my pocket and hand it to you on the spot. And let me tell you, it did a few things. One, it actually did find some bugs before we shipped the product, which was really helpful. Uh, so the couple hundred dollars that I had to give away was peanuts compared to the cost of a recall. But it also got everyone on the team excited about something and having some fun. And you know, it's hard to think about developing a medical product that's saving someone's life or you know, minimizing the risk of some surgical procedure going wrong. And, and then say, well, how can working on products that are so serious and so important, how can you have fun? Well, you need to try and have some fun and lighten up the environment once in a while. And this bug contest that I did, and I did it uh, more than, uh, you know, I did it a few times over the course of uh, several years, really helped uh, create a little bit more of a fun environment at work. So uh, being part of an internal venture team, I didn't have to go ask anyone in the corporation if I could do this, I just did it. And, and that's a nice thing. The other thing about being on a venture team is making sure not just you, as the entrepreneur or the leader of the team or the inventor, but anyone working with you have the same vision that you have. See the big picture as I call it. Because what, and, and I wanna tell a story because I've seen this too many times in the past in watching uh, venture teams is, uh, I call it the spoken wheel uh, structure. There is in the center of the wheel, the entrepreneur, the inventor, the one who started the company, the one who's got the patent or patents in his or her name. And then they surround themselves with the team. It doesn't matter if your team is five people or 25 people. The entrepreneur basically tells each person on the team every day what to do. Please run this experiment. And when you get the results, get back to me. Please order these parts. Please you know, run this study. Please do, you know, and they would be doing that from the center of the wheel and telling everyone exactly what they need to do. And it gives that entrepreneur one total control over their destiny. At least they believe it is total control, but it also loses the opportunity to hear back from the people that you've added to your team and to let them provide their creativity let them challenge some of your ideas because maybe they have a better idea than you do. And I think making sure that that doesn't happen and so that when you have your team, that you don't just become what I call the center of the wheel. And even though I've seen it many times in, in many companies over the years, it doesn't always end well. 
when you isolate yourself from your team in a way that they don't feel that they can really bring forth uh, their contribution to helping the company and the big picture become a success uh, for, for everyone. The other thing that was interesting about the TDX Venture, as you heard me say, all these people, mechanical engineers, packaging engineers, scientists, manufacturing, marketing, they all reported to the venture manager. So when I, when I use the term a, a cross-functional team, it is truly a cross-functional team. And seeing the kinds of successes you can have when you have that is amazing to see. And I know I've talked to and I've interviewed lots of people and they say, oh, I work on a cross-functional team. I have software engineer and mechanical engineer and electrical engineer all working together. And that's what, they, or I have the biologist and the chemist and the organic chemist all working together. And that's what I call a cross-functional team. When I use the term cross-functional, I'm talking about a variety of disciplines, all that are needed to ultimately make a successful product in the marketplace. The other thing that's interesting about venture teams, and I want to make sure people don't lose sight of, is there's a lot of things you need to do or you and your team need to do and don't shy away from learning them. So as part of the TDX venture at the time, Abbott at that time, believe it or not, in the diagnostic division didn't even have a market research team. We had to do our own market research. We went out and talked to customers. Now, we didn't always do it the best way, but we eventually learned how to do it and be more successful at it. We had to learn how to develop partnerships with external technology companies or manufacturing companies or suppliers. Um, obviously, when you're investing in some new technology, not just you as the inventor, but your team needs to learn the technology. When you're working in the medical field, you have to understand the quality environment that you're gonna work within the manufacturing challenges that you're gonna face, understand the business that you're part of, what is the FDA, what is Health Canada, what is Invisio, you know, what is the MDR? Well, all these terms come to mind and you go, wait a minute, I'm just trying to invent something, okay? I understand that, you're trying to invent something. What I'm trying to tell you is there's a lot of pieces of the business that are gonna re be required for you and your team to learn. And yeah, you can hire some people to come in and fill some gaps now and then like myself or even Ed, but ultimately, if you wanna have more control over your destiny, don't shy away from the opportunities to learn and to learn things that you have no idea what they are. So I'm gonna stop here on the TDX venture before I go on to the next one uh, and ask if there's any questions. Okay, I would have to say the TDX Venture was very successful. At our 25 year reunion that I mentioned, someone did a back of the envelope calculation and said, during those 25 years, the net profit that this product line brought to Abbott Laboratories was probably in excess of $5 billion. That means right to the bottom line. So not a bad deal. Okay, let's talk about vision. And one of the interesting things here was the core team from TDX was able to stay together to form the new team that was the nucleus for the vision venture. So what does that give you? So for example, it says here, instead of me being a software manager, I'm now the R&D engineering manager, okay? And my boss who was the R&D engineering manager is now the venture manager of this new business. I'm just using this as a couple of examples, but some of the other engineers came with us. And what does that give you? That gives you the opportunity to one, I know all these people that I'm working with, the good and the bad of, of interacting with these people, hopefully more good. And we, were, we really enjoyed working with each other. So let's go do it again. Why not? So sometimes that may present itself to you. I encourage you if it does, Take advantage of it. Once again, though, here's a new business for Abbott Diagnostics, and it was physician office diagnostics. But in this case, the team had decided we wanted to make a significant leapfrog in technology. And in this case, the technology was designed that a nurse 
could run the system. You did not need to be a formally trained lab technician working in a hospital to run the system. If you could do a finger stick, the kind of things like if you're a diabetic and you have to measure your glucose a few times a day, when you stick your finger and then draw up a little bit of blood, if you can do that, you could run this system. And so obviously to, when you wanna make giant leaps in technology, there are many pitfalls that you'll stumble into along the path. And trust me, we did. Um, but one of the things I find interesting, and I don't, I'm hoping you can see this, I'm putting it in front of my screen. This is the heart of the system uh, that one of, uh, one of my engineers actually on the team developed and designed. Um, but this is where we made 100 million of these several years after launching the product. I still keep it on my desk. Um, so I, I want you to understand there will be many pitfalls. And, but the thing is, please do not get discouraged. If you've got a vision and you've got a dream that you want to make become a reality, trust me, there will be things that go wrong. Um, I, I, and I'm going to tell a story in, a, in just a second about one of the things that went wrong and, and what ended up happening. Um, but as I said, once again, the team was co-located. In this case, so by the way, I got out of the basement. I was now on the first floor of the R&D building. So I moved up in the world. Um, the chemistry team and the engineering team each had a lab right across the hall from each other. And the chemistry manager and I sat next to each other. Actually, I got an office finally. Uh, sat next to me in an office right next to the labs that uh, our teammates were uh, working in. So once again, co-location, quick communication, quick, fast decision making. That's some of the advantages of, see, of working on an venture team is you're accountable to yourself and your team and ultimately your investors if you have some at the time. Our case, the investors are obviously the corporation. But I wanna tell a little story here where we had an external consultant and my internal team and we had a dilemma. We had a major technology issue that basically the product wasn't working, minor detail. Um, and so my internal team said, here is the solution that we would like to basically bring forward and start to work on. The external consultant who was working with us said, I have a different solution. Here is my solution that I would like us to start to work on. Ultimately, I had to make a decision as to how to move the project forward because we were basically stuck in the mud or down in a, in a pit right now and we needed a way out. And it was a very difficult decision because here are people, you know, my internal team, all Abbott employees like myself wearing Abbott badges saying this is what we should do and here's why. <clears throat> and we had this external consultant who was not wearing an, an Abbott badge, but it just so happened this consultant was the same consultant <clears throat> that worked with us on the TDX venture and actually worked with Abbott on a previous product prior to me even joining Abbott. So this external consultant has had a history of being very successful with some of their creative ideas. And so I basically wrestled back and forth to uh, with both teams trying to make a decision, but I knew we were stuck. I ended up going with the external consultant's idea. And I explained to my internal team, because obviously, let me just say that to say they were mad at me is probably an understatement. There's some other expletives I could probably use, but not on a Zoom call. And I had to explain to them why I thought their idea had the potential for more issues than the consultants. And I went through the technology analysis that I went through myself to, to make that decision. They still didn't like my decision because both, both approaches were still risky. Um, but then I sat down with the consultant and I basically told him why I picked his solution and why it was so important that obviously his solution work, uh, which I think was a good motivator. So one of the things about being a venture leader is how do you motivate your teammates? especially when things are not going well? And how do you try to avoid demotivating 
your teammates when you have to do something that is contrary to what, uh, what they uh, are thinking is the right way to right path forward. And it's not an easy situation. I am sure if you haven't been in those, you will encounter them. The good news is the external consultant eventually did get his approach to work. And it's actually in the product on the market uh, at the time, you know, when we launched the product. But it was not an easy decision to make. Uh, and uh, a couple of sleepless nights trying to figure out which, is, which way to go and why. But uh, I just want you to be aware, the key is you're never going to have perfect data to make a decision. You need to be comfortable understanding what data you have, what risk you're taking when you make a decision one way or the other. And then once you do, do not look back, look forward and figure out how to make that decision a success. Uh, I can only encourage you all to do that because otherwise second guessing yourself is, is really a bad consumption of your time and energy. Now, <clears throat> how to demo a product that's not quite working? Well, many of you probably have internal investors or maybe VCs or maybe family members that you're asking to help you in funding your program. In our case, in this case, it was senior management at Abbott who basically hold the purse strings. But technology is not always doing exactly what you want it to do. So what can you do to help quote unquote, sell what you're doing, not to be deceiving, but to sell it in the best light possible. And so that's where being a software guy comes in handy because clearly with software, you can control a lot of aspects of a product if you have software in your product, such as what you put on the display, what you simulate, et cetera, et cetera. And so oftentimes I was making demo software to not deceive anybody, but to try and make sure people understood where we were going and what we were trying to accomplish in the end. As a matter of fact, one time the vice president of marketing who ended up becoming the CEO of Abbott several years later uh, had asked me for, to dem be able to demonstrate something for him at a sales meeting. And so the day before the sales meeting, he came in the lab, I showed him the demonstration uh, of what we put together. And he said, I can't use this. I go, wait a minute, this is what you asked me for. Uh, and this was Miles White, who some of you may know was the CEO of Abbott. And he said, it is so good of a demo, of a demo. I'm afraid we're gonna go on back order before we're ready to sell the product. And so he actually didn't demonstrate it at a, or have me demonstrate it at a sales meeting because he thought we did too good a job uh, of demonstrating uh, the concept. So, um, but keep in mind, you will need to do that. Uh, I encourage you to do it in a ethical manner, but also making sure you're still selling your vision for your product, whatever it might be for the future. The last story I wanted to tell, which was a little bit of a nerve wracking story is we actually, the CEO came to my boss and myself and said, look, we need to demonstrate this product at an investor conference. An investor conference, some of you may know is where you know, all the investment community come together or you invite them to a meeting uh, and basically you're selling them on your company or your product or whatever it might be. <clears throat> In this case, our CEO wanted to sell the investment community on this new product because it was part of a new business. And so um, my boss and I actually shipped two devices, not one. Keep in mind, you should always have two uh, because if something goes wrong, you could better have a backup. The other thing is the morning before we demonstrated, before the meeting started, I had to set up the instruments. Well, the meeting was supposed to start at nine. I started about four. Why would I start so many hours before a meeting? I wanted to make absolutely certain everything was working perfectly because you only get one shot with the investor community and you wanna make sure you're putting your best foot forward. Uh, and lo and behold, one of the two units was not working properly. So by five in the morning, I am calling some of my teammates, waking them up in Chicago and saying, look, uh, we need to work through this topic. Uh, and by six, obviously we had it working because I did demonstrate both units uh, to the investment community. So 
the messages here are, if it can go wrong, it will. If you have to do a demonstration, try and have a backup with you. Meaning if you have one device you're gonna demonstrate, have a second one with you. Practice, 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 and set up as early as possible. Even if the, um, the, the hotel or wherever you might be doing a demonstration says, oh, well, you know, we don't open the, um, and start setting up until you know, an hour before the meeting. Baloney, give me the hotel manager. I want that room open several hours before the meeting because I want to set up really early. So be insistent, be very persistent, but do not lose the opportunity to put your best foot forward in the case of something like presenting your product to potential investors and making sure you have a backup in case something isn't quite uh, working the way you want it to work. Those are a couple of the lessons and a couple of things uh, that I've learned here from the Vision Venture. I will stop for a minute and ask if there's any questions, Laura. To our entrepreneurs, if they have any questions for Mark along the way, feel free to pipe in. Um, certainly there are demos that have gone wrong for our team. So I appreciate that insight, Mark. Um, if you know something isn't working, how do you best recover when it's live and you don't have another device? What is, what is the best way to talk your way through that you've got something that isn't quite working? I, the, well, the best way is if you know it's not working ahead of time to say that upfront, look, this product is supposed to do A, B, and C. Right now I've got A working, and but it's so important I want you to, envision and I'll explain to you and maybe even have a poster to show you what B and C looks like so you can at least visually tell the story even if B and C aren't working. So especially if you know ahead of time what's not working, be prepared, say it up front. So then people aren't thinking, oh well he's trying to you know pull a fast one on me. No, no, no. This isn't working, but I want to demonstrate this aspect to you now why we continue to advance the other aspects. That's what I've done. Uh, multiple times, multiple times, especially on complex electromechanical systems. Um, if something isn't working, but you still need to do a demonstration to show progress, just tell them and tell them when the other parts are going to be working. And then say, I'll be glad to come back in a month or a qu next quarter and show you the other components. So that's what I do. It's much easier than someone saying, wait a minute, what happened here after the fact? So Laura, hopefully that helps answer your question. Thank you. Sure. That's why, that's why, you know, when uh, I just want to make a point, everybody here is in the medical field. I am sure you've read enough stories where, oh, this guy is going to jail for deceptive practices. Um, this company did this and they, and they were, you know, and, and so one of the things you do not want is you do not want to be on the front page of the Chicago Tribune with your company and something really bad that you've done. <clears throat> you do not want that at any time. And so I just encourage you to understand running your business in an ethical way is not just the best short term, but the best long term way to behave and act all the time. I can't emphasize that enough, having done this for a, a number of years and have been through recalls and been through challenging situations before, but uh, you, you just have to be upfront and tell people. Mark, we've got one question. I know I wanna save time for these next slides. Sure, go ahead. About some new ventures. A question came in. Could you elaborate on how to keep the development on schedule and what happens if there are delays? Um, <clears throat> Let's, let, me, let me just be very frank. It is rare <clears throat> that I've been able to keep a program on schedule. And, and there's a several aspects of why that's gone wrong. And so let's talk about that for just a minute because I think it's a really important question. One is there's a term, you may have heard it before, called scope creep. And I'll explain it in case you've never heard that term before. In the middle of development, <clears throat> someone starts bringing new ideas to the table that, oh my God, if we just did that, we could have a much better product. Oh boy, if we did this, we could 
get into this other market at the same time and expand our market presence. That's what I call scope creep. Trying very hard, especially as a leader of a team, to, of, to just say no, not now, is the best way to avoid those scope creeps. I promise you every scope creep you do will be a delay. No matter what anybody says, I've been there, done that, and suffered the consequences too many times. Uh, matter of fact, I had a boss one time and in my performance review, basically had on a piece of paper, three words, learn to say no. That was it. Because I was such a nice guy, I was always saying, sure, I'll take on that, whatever it was, and we'll still try and keep the on schedule. Of course, we never did, but I'd always take it on anyway. And then my boss would get in trouble because we were late. Um, <clears throat> so that's really important. That's one way. The other way, which is a much more methodical approach, is to, as early as possible, assess risk. Now, there are always technical risk or technology risk. And that you have to try and overcome through parallel paths running your experiments and every time you run an experiment learn from it to continue to advance the technology but there's other kinds of risk and trying to identify them early and have mitigations in place so for example you've heard the term single source i've got this really unusual piece of equipment or a, a, a component that only one company in the world manufactures it's a company that's just down the street. There's three brothers that run it, and that's it. Trying to have a second source, it's easy for me to say, it's not easy to do. But what I'm trying to say is, how can you assess risk early? Keep an eye on them. Talk about them with your team, with yourself. It doesn't matter how big your team is. And say, do I have the mitigations in place in case that risk turns into an issue? And understanding the difference between a risk and an issue is something may go wrong, something has gone wrong. So those are the things I do to try and not miss my schedule by a lot. But those are the, those are the techniques that you really are the most common is avoiding scope creep and try and have identified your risk and have mitigations in place if a risk becomes an issue. Those are the two areas I focus on. Hopefully that answers your question. All right, let's go on um, to an, another uh, internal venture team. This is a team that I was the venture manager for. So this is the first venture team that I actually led. Uh, and it was also the first venture team within a different division of Abbott. Now I'm in the hospital division, not the diagnostics division. I showed you the picture of that syringe up front. But some of the things here that were really quite interesting is from my previous experiences, I emphasized to my manager the fact that I wanted a heavyweight team. Heavyweight team means I want everyone on the team reporting to me. As compared to a traditional program where there's a manufacturing person and there's a chemist and there's a couple engineers uh, and there's a marketing person, but they all report into their functional managers, not into the person leading the team. That's more of a traditional program management. But having been on other venture teams prior to this, where everybody reported into the one focal point, the venture leader, I wanted to do the same thing. And I was able to not only do that, but I was actually able to go around the hospital products division and recruit each person on my team, meaning I was able to go to a manager and say, look, I need someone from your group that would like to be part of our venture team. I explained it to them. And then I personally interviewed the people that they would be willing to allow me to steal and have them report to me directly, including going to a manufacturing location in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, and getting the plant manager to agree to let me have one of their people report directly to me. The reason that's so important is especially in a manufacturing world where things go wrong every day, you do not want your manufacturing engineer fighting fires half the time and working for your program half the time. 
So even when you as an entrepreneur go out and try and recruit, say, some manufacturing, say a contract manufacturer to help make something for you, try and get some people in that company dedicated just to you. Now you're going to have to pay for them, but it'll be worth it. Because when you're paying for somebody, that means they are responsible and accountable to you, not to the manufacturing organization or to the mainstream products that they're shipping and selling today. So uh, being able to recruit your team, which I'm sure many of you do today, but even outside your team, external partners that you're gonna work with to have those people dedicated to you. Once again, you can see there's a whole new series of technologies that I, was, I had to learn to be successful. Now I'm not in the uh, medical device area, I'm more in the pharma world. So now I'm learning about NDAs, ANDAs, SNDAs, not just 510Ks or PMAs, things like that. So once again, be open to learning new things, dig in, understand what's going on as best you can, because then you'll be able to sit down with your people and help make the best decisions possible going forward. Also, in the quality area. Now it's quality for pharma versus quality for a medical device. That's different. The regulatory world for SNDAs, ANDAs, NDAs is different than the regulatory world for 510Ks. Um, building a brand new manufacturing line with brand new technology that doesn't exist before. Many of you, I'm sure, are inventing things that have never seen daylight before, and you're going to have to invent new manufacturing processes. Don't be worried about it. Be under, understand the risk involved and try and find the best people you can to help you bring that process into a reality. And we'll talk about that uh, in a minute uh, on another uh, slide. I'll get to that. In a, I hope I'll get to that in a couple more minutes. But the syringe venture team, we uh, started working on it uh, in the early 1990s, we started launching products in 1995. Uh, by 1998, we had 30 different products on the market. And as I said, these syringes, like the one I showed you earlier, are still manufactured today. As a matter of fact, the one I showed you on the picture, if you've ever watched any of the medical shows on TV, and someone go, they say, oh, there's someone's coding, and they rush in with a crash cart, and they open it up and start giving drugs to the patients, uh, that syringe that I had on the first page there is one of those types of drugs that would sit in the top drawer of, of an emergency cart. Uh, so just as an example. The other interesting thing about not being worried about getting out and learning things is my very first patent came out of this venture team and I learned it during a market research study. So I was just listening to some nurses talk about products they use today and some of the challenges they use today of the products and we're trying to come up with you know an improved product and all of a sudden uh, they were telling a story and i came back and talked to our designer and said look i think this is something we could design and give us a competitive advantage over uh, other products like this and he said yep and it ended up becoming my first patent ever so don't be scared to get out in the field i know some of you have probably done i or been engaged in that or you're thinking about that where you get in front of customers and have a great learning opportunity do not shy away if that opportunity uh, makes good sense to you, or if you've done it already, hopefully you've learned some things. That's all I wanted to say about this one. I want to go uh, into one of those that did not work out so well. Uh, basically, I was employee number five. There were two brothers. One was an optometrist. One was a really smart uh, microelectronics engineer and two lawyers. One lawyer is a patent lawyer and one lawyer is a business lawyer. The patent lawyer asked me to join because he knew me from Abbott days working together. So I was employee number five. And literally we worked out of the, uh, one of their basements uh, for quite a while. But then eventually we started having to go to VCs and raise money. Okay, so you put your proposal together, you sell it, you give up some of the control. And after a few rounds, all of a sudden the VCs have a lot of say in your company. Now, we had some really good successes. Um, I, I was able to help the entrepreneur. We put together the, the IDE meeting package that went to the FDA and they said, sure, come on in and let's talk about a clinical trial. 
and they gave us the thumbs up based on that meeting. We then ran a clinical trial and the whole idea was to implant this device in, in one eye, not both, one eye, and see if the patient started to regain some sight. And basically uh, we did 10 patients, half of them regained some sight in the one eye with the implant. So it really was a, a surprisingly successful clinical trial uh, for us. But as we continued to advance and as the company continued to grow, of course, one of the things VCs want is they want a CEO. Well, the first two CEOs they brought on when I met with them uh, and still, I wasn't a full-time employee, I was a part-time employee. Basically, they didn't care for me. Now, I didn't take that personally because what happened was during a dinner conversation where we were just chatting, it became obvious that I knew more than they did about developing medical products. And I don't think they liked the idea that they would bring someone on probably as a COO uh, who knew more than they did about almost everything around the business. And so uh, I never did join. The third CEO actually did like me, but I decided at that point not to, uh, to join the company uh, as a full-time employee. I stayed as a part-time employee and actually a member of the board. But the key message here was to, a few things. One, there's gonna be a point in time where you're gonna to have to interact with the FDA try and read the regulations. Yeah, they may be long, they may be boring, but the more you understand, the better you and whoever is working with you will be able to put together the presentation or the documentation package to go to the FDA. They are not bad people. They are there to bring great medical products to the world, or in this case, if it's the FDA, to the United States. That's what their job is. Their job is not to make you feel like a little person or to give you a hard time, their job is to help you, but at the same time, ensure the safety and efficacy of whatever it is you're bringing to the market. So I've always had great interactions with the FDA on a num number of occasions, even when they come in and audit. But as you start to have to give away control of your company to some venture, start, venture capitalist, be prepared for a number of times where you and they will not agree. And in this case, it became to the point where the inventor and the VCs were on totally opposite sides and ended up basically the VC said, no more money, we're done. It ended up in a lawsuit, but uh, it, it got you know, resolved and you know, uh, it, it ended up the company folded after about five years. So it was a great product. You know, if you're, when you're talking to people that are blind and you can help them see again, that's a great mission. That's a great program to be part of. And I really enjoyed the time that I spent with them. I worked a lot of weekends and nights and took vacations, you know, it was part of my vacation. Um, but giving up control is not all, it, you know, it's not all roses. And so I want you to be sensitive to that, be aware of that. And there may be a point in time where, you know what, I just want to stay inventing, let the VCs run the company because I just like doing this part. I don't want to have to do all this business and other malarkey. And if that's the case, so be it. In this case, uh, the inventor did not want to give up control to the VCs and then that's what happened. So let me stop here and see if there's any questions before I go on to the uh, last topic I wanted, the last slide I wanted to cover. Laura, in the, because I want to be respectful for everyone's time, I'm not going to talk about this particular uh, venture. This is one that's ongoing right now, but I want to get to a couple key key takeaways that I think are really important things that I wanted to make sure people understand. You've heard the phrase, and all I can say is, don't just hear it, live it. Be a lifelong learner. Don't shy away from the opportunity to learn about something that you don't know today. Don't worry about possibly, you know, asking Ed or myself or someone for some advice periodically, but don't take a, on a consultant and hopefully keep them there for years and years. You know, take them for what you need them for and then throw them away and continue moving forward. But be a lifelong learner. I have never regretted all the different things I've learned over the 40 years, even though I may say I'm an R&D guy, I've worked in all aspects of our business. 
Uh, I've, I've been at exhibition halls, launching new products. I've been in front of the FDA. I've been around the world, uh, interacting with uh, strategic partners and teammates and, and different market, you know, marketing gurus and medical people from all over the world. And I've enjoyed it forever. So please do that. The second is, as hard as it is, try to do more listening than speaking. Now, yes, I know I've been talking for an hour. This is not my norm, but I encourage you to do that because when you're listening is when you're hearing other ideas and other perspectives that you need to be able to use to balance off your own. Third, know what you don't know. There are too many people that think they know everything. Uh, my advice to you is if you, if you know you don't know something, appreciate it and don't go figure out how to learn about it. Be prepared to compromise. Not the easiest thing for most entrepreneurs. But all I can say is be prepared because there's going to be time when if you don't, you'll be sorry in the long run. And the last point, which, which um, I think Laura, Ed and I were, hmm, seemed like quite a while ago when we were down there and I was talking about design history files with uh, some of the folks uh, in the building over a year now. You are developing two products. You should never lose sight of it. If you're gonna be in this medical space, you are developing a product that your customer is gonna use and you're developing the documentation that tells the story of how you develop that product. One without the other in this industry is a recipe for failure. And, I, and, I, and that's why I think, uh, well, Ed, if I'm not mistaken, it was a little over a year ago when we came down to uh, Champaign and did the, that presentation. We talked about a few topics, but I covered a design history file, I think, at that time. If you don't believe me, I can assure you, you will regret it if, if you don't. And, and, and even though no one likes to do the documentation, it's not that much fun. It seems like a bunch of baloney, blah, 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 blah. I've heard it all. And all I can tell you is with the, this company that I didn't get to talk about today, one of the challenges we're facing with this entrepreneurial startup is they do not want to do the documentation. They just want to go, go, go. Well, guess what? They've encountered some difficulties recently. And, and that's where I hate to say I told you so, but I, I did because there was some documentation that they didn't generate and it made it very difficult to do some troubleshooting at a, at a stage where you didn't really want to have to struggle and you wanted to keep moving forward. Um, so I just want to say that I've, that's a challenge that this company has faced. I think I've got everybody on board now. Uh, we'll see how, we, how it goes over the next several months. But uh, uh, I can assure you, you, you do not want to do it, but I can promise you if you don't, you'll regret it. So with that, Laura, I think I'll stop. It is one o'clock. Uh, I can hang around for a few more minutes, but I want to be respectful for everybody's time. Well, thank you, Mark. We did have one question that I'll go to, and then I am going to wrap up in the interest of time. Dr. Sapersky asked, how, how early is the right time to engage the FDA? And I'll okay. say medical device in this circumstance. <clears throat> okay, I would say the right time to engage the FDA is when there's a question that you feel you need an answer for today. <clears throat> That's the right time. And so I want to be very careful about that because this has been a dilemma that a, a lot of entrepreneurs have faced. Well, should I go talk to the FDA? If you want to go talk to the FDA, you need to bring forward, here is what we're doing. Here is what we're proposing to do. And why do you see any issues or, or hear back from them? So you can't, you don't just walk in. The, the worst thing to do is walk in the FDA and say, look, I have this great idea. What do you think I should do? That is a terrible way to approach the FDA. So I think the right time has to be when you are in a position of needing to make a critical decision. You believe this is the way you want to go but you think you need confirmation from the FDA that that is the way to approach it. That's been my experience. So, um, you know, I, if I walk into the FDA with something, it's because 
I want them to agree with a position that I'm taking or an, uh, an approach that we're planning to take because of this, this, and this is how we interpret the regulations. And if we're doing it wrong, obviously they'll tell us, but otherwise they hopefully the result is, yep, you've interpreted correctly, keep marching. Uh, that's been uh, my advice. The other thing you gotta be careful of today, especially is they are overwhelmed right now <clears throat> because if, uh, you know, if you're working on COVID and it's something, a COVID area that they're interested in, it'll go to the top of their pile. If you're working in something that's not COVID, it is not easy right now to get their attention. So uh, I would, I apologize that I don't have a better answer for you, but it's almost on a case by case basis as to why you think you need to go there and have a position that you're taking and you wanna either get confirmation or have them tell you no, and here's a different approach you need to take. And in some cases they won't tell you. I've had meetings with the FDA where we said, we want to do this. And the answer was, well, when you make your submission, I'll let you know if that's the right approach. Honest, I've had them tell me that before. So it's, uh, and I go, oh, Jesus, now we got to hope that we're taking the right decision. And if not, well, we're going to lose some time and money along the way. Uh, I've had that too. I hate to say it, Laura, but. Uh, well, thanks, Mark. I think that's great advice. And a number of our entrepreneurs may be seeking FDA approval at some point in their venture. So yeah. I going to put a recommendation, talk to somebody like Mark, who's been there, who's talked with the FDA, who's had to get product approval, and he might be able to help you think about that pathway and the right time to do so and how to be prepared for that meeting. So that's one of the things Mark might be able to assist you on in his entrepreneur in residence capacity here at the University of Illinois Research Park. If you'd like to sign up for time for with him, there is information in the chat and you can find that on our website. So researchpark.illinois.edu, edu resources, EIR. Mark, thanks for being a proud University of Illinois graduate from the Granger College of Engineering and coming back to share your wisdom with our entrepreneurs. Have a great day, everyone. Okay, thank you all. Bye-bye.